And I'm just, <laughs> this is what we call uh, live on the run TV. I used to be a TV critic, never a TV star for obvious reasons. Uh, Senator, welcome. Thank you. Um, if you could sit down there and um, why don't you'll be, this, this, this is both on the radio and on television. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad I wore the blazer today. <laughs> And so I, I've introduced you already, but I will do so again now that you're here. I'm with St yes. State Senator Diana DiZoglia, who is representing much of the lower Merrimack Valley. Uh, Senator, welcome here, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's a busy time of year, it's I know. It's a very busy time. <laughs> so I want to talk about um, the famous kayak trip down the river once we get there. But before I ask that question, you've been uh, a real proponent for the river for a long time and you know even uh, several years ago you were writing thoughtful letters to the editor and thoughtful pieces other places talking about the need to keep the river clean uh, the need to be careful about sewage dischargers which we'll talk about so my question to you is how long have you been interested in the health of the river and what got you involved in in this uh, to me a very important issue well, thank you. It's a great question. I was actually born and raised right here in the Merrimack Valley uh, in Methuen, and that's currently where I own my home. And as a lifelong resident of the Merrimack Valley, the Merrimack River is very near and dear to my heart, as I'm sure that it is to everybody here in the studio and all the listeners at home. Uh, so that is where my, my love for the Merrimack came in. Uh, it is one of our uh, you know, main sources of life here. Uh, without the Merrimack, I don't really think anybody would, would be here. It was the economic engine of the Merrimack Valley years ago when we had the mill buildings operating in Lowell and Haverhill and Lawrence. Uh, so it is what brought everybody into this region, and we're all here, I believe, because of the river. Now, the way that we have treated the river <laughs> in past years has really not been, uh, you know, something that expresses gratefulness towards all of the contributions that the river has made to our lives, to our economic development, to our health and wellness, uh, and to our vitality as a community. So uh, I believe that, you know, we made some great progress in the 1970s when the Clean Water Act was passed and when we did see federal dollars come back into Massachusetts that helped you know with the the Charles River other mm -hmm. rivers and with the Merrimack to help to clean up update infrastructure and make those needed improvements to really get us up to uh, uh, you know a place where we needed to be at the time that was consistent with environmental factors at that time mm -hmm. but in recent years due to climate change environmental factors uh, increased rainfall and the water levels rising uh, uh, that water table rising, uh, times have changed, and there's been a lot of erosion along the Merrimack River. Uh, homes that used to be, uh, you know, and don't don't quote me on the exact amount, yeah. but you know, based on what I saw mm -hmm. kayaking, generally speaking, it seemed as though it was, you know, homes that were about, uh, you know, maybe a hundred a hundred feet away from the river were now, you know, ten feet away from mm -hmm. the river, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, the erosion is happening along the river because of that water rising, but what's also happening is combined sewer overflows. The CSOs. The CSOs. And what this is, for anybody who's listening who isn't aware of, uh, you know, combined sewer overflow and what that means, or, or our little acronym that we use, CSO, uh, to make it easier for us, it is when the runoff from the streets... All the oil and the gasoline and the toxins, it's all over the roads uh, and in those sewers actually uh, comes out of the, the sewers onto the streets. All the runoff from the streets mixes in when there's a heavy rainstorm, mixes in with the sewage from our bathrooms, from our homes, anything that we uh, pour down the drain, flush down the toilet, mm -hmm. that all gets mixed in with the runoff from the streets and is supposed to go to a water treatment facility where that water is chemically treated and put through a process before it is emptied out into our water supply. What happens when a CSO happens is that does not happen, that doesn't take place. The water does not end up being treated and is it is instead dumped into the river un completely untreated. And this happens when there's heavy rainfall and 
the uh, water treatment facilities can't handle the amount of water that's being rushed in mm -hmm. to the treatment plant, uh, or when there's a power outage because we don't have, uh, you know, these the generators that we need necessarily at these treatment facilities. So if the power goes down, everything goes out, water goes into the river. You know, several months ago, you convened um, the inaugural meeting of the Merrimack River Commission, um, and there were local, state, and federal um, employees there. There were people from the private sector. You, you and uh, Mayor Donna Holiday of Newburyport um, were effective in pulling that together. Can you talk a little bit about that? And it was funded, at least on paper, and then I think it uh, may have bogged down in the Senate. And perhaps you can give us a little more information on the funding for the River Commission and what you hope will come from that commission. Certainly. Well, right before we had the conversation about starting this Merrimack River District Commission and local task force, we had, you know, uh, been working on trying to get grant money released from the state for the generator to be uh, placed in the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District to help with the sewage overflows uh, with that issue. And we were able to secure that grant money, bring that back to the area. So I am happy to report that there will be a generator at the Greater mm -hmm. Lawrence Sanitary District now, and uh, a large portion of that will be paid for by the state. So that will help significantly when there are power outages to prevent those uh, overflows from happening into the river. And we were working on that issue and trying to get that grant money. And then, you know, during one of those conversations, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could pull all of these different communities together? And I had said to the mayor, you know, Mayor, listen, and Representative Kelcourse was also in that meeting, but I had said to the mayor and to Representative Kelcourse, you know, every community I go to, they're talking about this issue right now, especially along the seacoast. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, everybody's talking, but I'm noticing that a lot of the different advocates and local officials aren't necessarily communicating mm -hmm. with each other across municipal lines. And I think it's really important that we don't duplicate efforts and that we are information sharing to make sure that we are getting the best, you know, bang for our buck, so to speak, that we are actually making some progress on this, but that we're working together as a region, as, as uh, you know, sort of Merrimack River community, all the communities is that that border the Merrimack River to actually come up with some short-term goals and some long-term goals about how to best impact the overall health of the river long term and that is you know having to do with CSOs but also having to do with the overall health uh, you know, we have uh, some endangered species in the river. Uh, we were hearing about that yesterday on a, on a boat tour that I actually went out on from Lowell's Boat Shop I, I in Amesbury. Uh, um, we have pollution issues. Yes. And as I recall, well, I don't recall this, but uh, from reading, the gundalo used to be um, a very effective barge here on the Merrimack River, and um, it would you know, a lot of what we've heard is about clipper ships and fishing boats, but the gundalo, and there was very much commerce all the way up and down the river. So you were on the gundalo last night. It was a pretty night for it. It was a beautiful, beautiful evening. The sunset was incredible. Uh, you know, you have this beautiful sail overhead and a bunch of advocates who love the river, <laughs> who are out there talking about ways to improve our community. And, uh, you know, you can't really, it doesn't get much better than that, I'll be honest. So it was a, it was a, it was uh, I was humbled to be able to speak uh, to the residents on that that gondola and to also hear from from other advocates. Uh, we did have a couple of others speak, uh, some people from the Merrimack River Watershed Council, mm -hmm. amongst others. So it was a great. Well, I was there um, momentarily to talk to some of the organizers, and I was struck. Uh, first of all, the the boat itself was sold out, so there was a real demand. And I was struck, just as you said, about the earnestness and the desire of a lot of people to find out what they can do and, you know, to really help the river get a little better. I was struck by that, just as you mentioned. Yes, it was wonderful. It was just as you said. You know, I mean, it was a bunch of advocates getting together who really care, who want to make a positive impact. But it takes all of us. We all have a role to play. Uh, you know, you're creating awareness right now and raising awareness by having me on this radio show so we can get the word out that we need mm -hmm. people to keep advocating. I'm trying to file stuff at the state level. We have all of our advocacy groups working on finding, you know, new initiatives and new paths towards, uh, you know, making sure legislators are getting information and local officials are being held accountable, so on and so forth. So, so 
it was really fun last night. And the district commission uh, was sort of, you know, last night was sort of um, like a smaller version of mm -hmm. what the district commission actually is. And it was in a little bit prettier of a setting than when we normally get <laughs> to have beautiful. the meetings. Uh, you know, but it is advocates getting together consistently to have those consistent conversations to make sure that we don't just pass a bill and then forget about it, but that we there's a concerted and consistent effort surrounding the overall health of the Merrimack River. Well, talking about boat trips, um, several weeks ago you were among um, several dozen dozen people who uh, went on a uh, kayak trip. It started in New Hampshire, 117 miles. That's the magic number that the Merrimack is. And that seemed like an inspiring moment. And you were on several legs of it. And it certainly seemed, you know, like there was unity and there was belief. And um, what did you come away from that? I mean, I thought it, it was a great event to bring attention to the river, which you did. What, what do you, did you bring away from that? The first takeaway was extremely sore arm and shoulders. <laughs> um, but the second takeaway was an amazing uh, renewed appreciation for the river as, you know, not only an economic uh, resource for our communities, but also as a recreational mm -hmm. resource. I think that, you know, it's, it's great that we are talking about the issue of combined sewer overflows. It's great that we're talking about the need to consistently focus on pollution and combating pollution and making sure that we're aware of possible contaminants that might be in the river. But I think it's also really important that we let people know about how clean the river is in comparison with years ago and that it is a really great recreational resource. We had a phenomenal time out there on the Merrimack. There are rope swings, there are other kayakers, mm -hmm. there are paddle boarders, there are people out with their families on boats, there are picnic tables along the Merrimack, especially as you go up into New Hampshire. And it seems as though that becomes less so as you come into Massachusetts. I noticed that there were a lot more of those mm -hmm. you know, recreational sites sort of set up up in New Hampshire and a little bit less so when you got into uh, you know Massachusetts and then uh, into into our, our local area here obviously you see more boats when you start to get into Amesbury uh, and Newburyport and that's due to uh, you know the fact that certain areas need to be dredged in order to allow passage mm -hmm. uh, and you can't pass through a, a big dam that's also set up in the city of that's Lawrence right. uh, but that. certainly we want to make sure that we are advertising to people that there are great recreational opportunities, the uh, boathouse in Lawrence uh, uh, that has different uh, classes for children mm -hmm. who want to learn how to sail and for families who want to learn how to kayak and, and how to get on the river with a boat and they want opportunities like that. That's a great community resource that's actually in the city of Lawrence that provides a way for people to get engaged with the river and it's fun and it's exciting and it's all about the family, bringing families together uh, and getting people out in nature, providing that opportunity for them and I think that you know those types of things that we saw along the river, it really just renewed renewed the passion that we already all had already getting on the mm -hmm. river, but it renewed that passion and kind of, you know, reignited that flame to make sure that we are informing residents and trying to keep residents engaged with all the opportunities that the Merrimack has to offer. Uh, also, there was a spill regarding CSOs while we were on the river. There was a combined sewer overflow during the time that we were on the river. And while it was unfortunate because we were on kayaks and we weren't going to stop we were going to continue <laughs> on um and just try to be you know safe uh i think that it was actually uh very timely that that happened while we were on the river because how did you become aware of it uh, we got some phone calls, and a lot of us didn't have our phones on, but we were checking them periodically throughout the day. And when I turned my phone on, I had a couple of text messages and phone calls missed, and they said, you know, be careful, there's a there's a CSO that's occurred. Did you see any evidence of it? I, I don't know that I did. I did see some spots along the river that seemed a little kind of, you know, eh, I don't know if I want to go over there, a little right. foamy. <laughs> um, that I kind of would have stayed away from anyways. Um, but... You know, you, you still, you want to proceed with caution. You know, you're you're not really inclined to jump in the water when you sure. hear that there's been a sewer overflow, even if you can't see it necessarily. Um, but I will say that it was timely because it did present uh, an, an opportunity for us to highlight the need for a consistent and concerted focus on, you know, 
passing legislation to help prevent the sewer overflows and trying to secure federal dollars all the way, you know, to help in, in our area all the way up into New Hampshire to do the long, <clears throat> the long term, <coughs> excuse me, the long term updates that are needed regarding overall infrastructure updates that is going to cost, you know, a few billion dollars. So we need to make sure we're getting those federal funds in. But uh, it did serve to highlight the extreme need for that. I uh, got a lot of press coverage on on the need for those updates. So well, my name is Dyke Hendrickson. I'm the host of the podcast, which is Lifelong to Merrimack. I'm with State Senator DeGoglio. I'm sorry, I, I may have messed that up. DeGoglio, I'm sorry. That's and quite all right. <laughs> we're talking about uh, some of the recreational opportunities, and you know, we've certainly had them in the Merrimack River. In recent years, there are now 1,500 uh, recreational vessels uh, tied up just on the Newburyport side and Amesbury and Salisbury as well. We are at the end of the line down here. You did mention a little about federal <clears throat> money and co congressional representatives including Trahan and uh, Seth Moulton I think are, have identified a federal program. I think they're looking into a request of $500 million. Um, are you optimistic about that or is it just going to take some time to um, you know, see if that works out? I really so I I would love to be able to answer that fully but I think that you know it would be presumptuous of me to say how I feel about their their you know uh, ability to actually secure that funding with this administration and all that's going on with the Senate and the House in DC as I'm not there so I think that's a question that's better uh given to the federal delegation. And I know if you have Congressman Moulton or Congresswoman mm -hmm. Trahan on here, that they'd be more than happy to engage with you and be able to answer that a little bit better than I can as a state senator. However, I would like to say that our federal delegation has been extremely supportive on all counts mm -hmm. at assisting us at every turn in trying to secure that funding. And they have heard us loud and clear when uh, our congressional representatives can't be at these district meetings. They send staff, uh, higher level staff, Mm -hmm. that can really help out, that understand the issue clearly, and that do take our concerns back. And that is the reason why they ended up filing that federal legislation. So they've been great partners, and uh, I have nothing bad to say. Uh, all good things. They are working really hard to get that funding, I know. Well, you took over from Senator Kathleen O'Connor Ives, who was a city councilor here, and she served several terms in the state Senate. What are some of the other things that you've been working on in your time in the state Senate? I know you are a House rep as well, but in the state Senate, in addition to the river, you've been involved in opioid control, have you not? Yes. Uh, substance use disorder is very near and dear to my heart. As many of the listeners, uh, you know, probably have uh, I have loved ones who have suffered with the disease of addiction and it's been incredibly difficult on the family uh, and friends surrounding those loved ones and you know other than the legislation that we've been working on it is something you know that impacts uh, you know the community overall um, we are working on legislation we are uh, continuing to work on legislation. A few years back, I've been in the legislature now uh, since I got elected in 2012. So uh, I was a state representative before I was a senator. Mm -hmm. Now I've, I've moved on to the Senate. But uh, as a state representative, I was able to pass some legislation regarding the prescriptions, uh, the, the prescribing of opioids to young children, making sure that we are reining in the prescription opioids that were being handed out to children under the age of 17. Uh, there are some stipulations put in place now. There is a limit on how much doctors are allowed to prescribe and when they're allowed to prescribe them. It has to be extreme cases like cancer, uh, you know, emergency circumstances, palliative care, uh, and the likes of those things, those extreme circumstances. But it can't be given to children, uh, you know, automatically just mm -hmm. for you know, a toothache or a muscle ache of some, of some sort. It has to be some extreme circumstance. And I think that that's really important because, uh, you know, our doctors weren't educated about the dangers of opioids when this when these drugs originally came out when Purdue Pharma and companies like Purdue Pharma mm -hmm. were starting to push these opioid prescriptions, uh, so we have done a lot around education for pharmacists.
pharmacists, education around doctors, limits on prescription opioids, prescription monitoring programs have been implemented. Uh, and uh, you know that's all been great. We've done a lot with treatment and recovery and reducing the rate of recidivism. But I will tell you, we have not done enough regarding prevention and education strategies when it comes to substance use disorder. And that right there is the key to making sure that we are able to curb the abuse of the substance and the overdoses that we've been seeing that has really devastated all of our communities. Uh, you know, once somebody actually picks up that substance for the first time, mm -hmm. because of the chemical uh, impact that it has on your brain and on your body physically, physically, mentally, emotionally, that has been scientifically proven to do so it can become addictive to people even after one use. And we need to prevent people from picking up that pill for the first time, from using that substance for the first time. But we have not done enough at the state level towards the area of prevention and education. So that is something that I continue to work on, mm. uh, trying to get substance use prevention and education curriculum Im implemented in our public schools by working together with our teachers associations, our PTOs, and our superintendents, uh, but also making sure that we're providing our youth centers and our community outreach programs with the resources that they need to have a community response to this and to stay engaged with parents whose children are struggling or with spouses you know of, of, of addicted persons uh, so on and so forth uh, we need to be giving the tools to the community that the community needs in order to uh, prevent these tragedies from taking place, prevent addiction from taking place to begin with. And that's well, going to stop. One of the stop. alarming elements of the river, as you know, is, you know, in some of our communities, you know, syringes are found on the river or on the shore. And I know you're quite aware I of this. I spoke about but... that last night. Yes, uh, it, it is true. And well, I can say the river is a lot cleaner than it used to be, and it has been cleaned up tremendously. So I have to give kudos where it's due to the, the mayors and uh, local leaders in those communities lining the river. There has been a lot of cleanup in recent years. I've been on the rev river a couple of years ago. I was on the river recently. There was there were a few needles that we did see on the banks in mm -hmm. certain communities coming into uh, to our neck of the woods um, in you know Lowell, Haverhill, Lawrence, Methuen, um, and coming down this region. But um, it was a lot better than it has been in recent years. And I think that you know, we need to keep, not just continue the effort, but I would say we need to double our efforts up when it comes to, to cleaning up the banks of the Merrimack and, and making sure that we're getting the trash out and, and dangerous uh, substances and dangerous uh, you know, needles mm -hmm. out of the river. When we talk about cleaning the river, and of course no one wants a new tax or new tax uh, burden, but in some communities, as you know, they create uh, taxing districts. Um, you know, it could be for water, it could be for sewage. Has that been brought up? Like in Portland, Maine, for instance, they have what they call a rain tax because they were getting a lot of sewage overflow in the Casco Bay. So, you know, they have this calibration where if it rains a lot one summer, you get a, you're going to have to pay a little more on the bill because they have to keep trying to separate the, the rainwater from the sewage. Has, has a taxing district uh, ever been discussed? Has a, has a what ever been a discussed? A taxing district. In other words, if you took 16 communities along the Merrimack River and said, we're going to have a, um, a sanitary gotcha. cleanup district and we're gotcha. going to charge everybody five bucks a year. Now, I, I've heard in discussion people say, well, perhaps Lawrence and Havel couldn't afford it. On the other hand, you know, it's happened elsewhere. Right. Ha has this notion of paying a little more come up? So it has, not in those terms. Uh, nobody's ever come to me personally at this point. I'm sure I'll be hearing about it now that we're on the radio <laughs> talking about it. Uh, nobody's ever approached me about a taxing district per se, but they have uh, come, come to me with uh, different examples or ideas about how to bring our communities together uh, with some sort of shared financial responsibility towards the Merrimack River and making sure that we continue to keep it clean and get it even cleaner. Uh, and yes, those conversations have been had with me concerning a community's ability to pay. Mm -hmm. Similar to the conversations we have around education, for example, some communities can afford to pay a little bit more than others can, and that's always taken into account when we make state policy regarding our education uh, initiatives. Uh, I think similarly, 
you know, that's what's happening with the Merrimack River and that those conversations are being had. As far as any movement with that, we still need to make sure that we can get all of the communities to the table to start having the conversation about the Merrimack, and that hasn't happened yet. So we are working uh, with the commission. The commission is meeting at the end of September. We so are meeting, yes. M- maybe maybe that will uh, bring a little discussion out. Yes, we are meeting on Monday, September 30th, I believe yes, it is, it is. Uh, at Harbor Place in Haverhill. Email me if you need any more information about that, diana.dezoglio at masenate.gov. Uh, and I'll be happy to send you some info about that if you'd like to attend that meeting. But, uh, you know, that commission meeting has seen a lot of attendance from the greater Newburyport, mm-hmm. greater Haverhill, and greater Lawrence area, uh, and greater Lowell area. I have to say the sanitary district from Lowell and some of the elected officials have shown up from Lowell. Beyond that, it's been kind of difficult to get uh, people to come out. Now, I don't know if we can, you know, maybe move some of the meetings down to the other uh, end of the river and maybe get Mm -hmm. some more people to come out that way. We'll just change the location every so often. Uh, But certainly we are working to try to get people involved along with our New Hampshire delegation. That's right. (laughs) I have to say that because, you know, um, a lot of people contact and they say the state needs to do this, the state needs to do that, and I couldn't agree more. The state does need to take responsibility for what we have responsibility for. New Hampshire is involved in this, however, and that's where our federal partners come in because we can't, uh, you know, force New Hampshire to do anything. They have to come to the table on their own. So uh, we are working on that. With I'm with Senator DeZoglio. I'm Dyke Hendrickson, the host of uh, Lifelong the Merrimack, a podcast. Um, I want to thank you for coming here today. Thank you uh, so much now, for the book to your right me. is my last book that I wrote. It's called Nautical Newburyport, A History of Captains, Clipper Ships, and the Coast Guard. So this is a gift. Um, and I hope you can. Re- I was eyeing this the whole time I was <laughs> sitting here. Like, this looks like a great book. Thank you. I'm going to show this to the viewers. Yeah, please. You can just do. see that. It's very exciting. So, um, I won't go into the whole thing, but it has been great to have you. Um, I am the outreach historian for the Maritime Museum. We're having a big exhibit this spring on photos artworks and artifacts of the Merrimack River going all the way up to at least Manchester, New Hampshire. So perhaps I could contact you on that and you could be aware of it as it gets closer. Absolutely. And just as an FYI, I am bringing the uh, Senate president and several senators that I serve with to Newburyport and Amesbury, the region for a tour of a few different sites that are here to highlight some of the different, uh, you know, uh, opportunities that are taking place in this region, along with some of the challenges that we're facing to make uh, those things more salient to my colleagues in the hopes of passing legislation that will help our community. And our final stop on Tuesday, September 17th, is going to be at the Custom Maritime Museum. Oh, good. Custom House Maritime Museum. So I want to thank you for your work there. I'll be on the front steps waiting. Yeah, so <laughs> well, we will be there. thank you very much, Senator. We're just about out of time. We could have had a longer discussion. You were very insightful. You've been a leader in the battle to clean up the Merrimack River. Thank you for appearing, and we look forward to seeing you you again. It's my pleasure. Thank you.